also have plan B because it, if you don't have plan B, you really don't have a plan. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final penultimate, I mean, the final, the ultimate session <laughs> of our, I'll get it right, <laughs> just give me time, um, uh, our session today, and uh, as usual, it's a policy panel made up of uh, policymakers. We've heard from a lot of policymakers today, but this is an opportunity to bring together four presidents to uh, talk about our, op our, uh, our activities today. I want to start by just taking a couple of minutes um, to say that I want to applaud the Fed's efforts um, to review its strategies, tools, communications for conducting policy and how they meet their uh, congressional mandates. I think this is a tremendous effort. I think it's an important effort, and I want to applaud it. Um, I think it has an opportunity to bring lots of insights for the Fed itself as well as the outside world about how the Fed thinks about things. And so I think it's a great opportunity. But to seize that opportunity, I think, uh, I really want to stress that I believe th the best kind of outcome, and they allude to this in their statement, the statement, but uh, is communicating at the end of the day how the strategy, whichever strategy they choose, their tools and their communications all fit together. The coherence of tools, strategy tools and communications, the coherence of that message can be vitally important to the Fed in the longer run, regardless of which strategy they choose for the moment. But integrating those things is going to be really important and very useful. And I think among other things, it will uh, help encourage the Fed and encourage policy to be more coherent, more systematic, and a better communicator in the process. So I really would like to, to stress that I think that part of the success and the payoff from this exercise is going to be that ability to tie strategy, tools, and communications together. Um, and um, so um, but I think the, at the same time, it will matter what strategy they choose. And I think I'd like to emphasize, I guess, a couple of things with regard to that. The challenge of, of adopting a new strategy, whatever that may be, um, uh, will carry with it its own set of challenges. And what I'm afraid of, or what I think could happen if we're not careful, is the Fed could have a new strategy, but in the process, if they fail to articulate the way the tools and the communications and the strategy all fit together and how they're going to execute that, then what will happen is the new strategy will look a lot like the old strategy. Too much discretion, too much ability to leave, to create leeway between their tools, actions, and communications and strategies will just look like the old uh, discretionary regime. So tying those pieces together, I think, is going to be an important part of the success of this effort and the payoff to this effort if they, in fact, pull it off. The other point I would make about strategies, I think, is that um, when considering strategies, I think the Fed needs to be very careful about overpromising. I think they need to understand and accept some humility about what they, in fact, can deliver on and the precision with which they can deliver that so the public understands you know, what the Fed actually can and can't do. I think a big danger, or a risk, if you will, would be the Fed promising some degree of precision in their strategy and then get frustrated over and over again by not being able to deliver with, with that precision what the markets think they do. So I think part of the communications is about uh, setting expectations right with the market in, in terms of what the Fed is able to do. Uh, making sure that there's not too much hubris, hubris and that there's some humility in that new strategy and that they communicate that in an effective way as part of this package because otherwise they will find themselves lacking credibility and if they don't have credibility then, then whatever new strategy they pick is probably going to fail and that's why it'll end up looking so I, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic 
And I'm very uh, pleased that this effort's going on, and we've heard a lot of pieces of, of it today, and I hope we hear some more about it this afternoon. So uh, with that preamble, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to our presidents, Rob Kaplan from Dallas, Mary Daly from San Francisco, Jim Buller from St. Louis, and Loretta Mester uh, from uh, Cleveland. I almost said Philadelphia, but, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a reason for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, welcome them all to, to, uh, to the Hoover Institute and to this conference. And um, I'm gonna turn the floor, floor over to you guys and Rob Kaplan's gonna go first. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, hosting this conference. It's been a great conference, and thanks for inviting us. Thank you, Charlie, and I'm thrilled to be here speaking along with my Fed colleagues and with all of you here in the room. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, as all of you know, headline personal consumption expenditures, PC inflation, the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation measure, has been running below our 2% target for a substantial portion of the time period since 2012. Um, at the Dallas Fed, may not surprise you, we particularly focus on a trim mean measure of core PC inflation. This filters out extreme upside and downside moves in inflation components. We find this to be a very useful indicator of underlying inflation trends. And this trim, trim mean measure is running in the neighborhood of 2% on a trailing 12-month basis, but it's fair to say it has also been in the range of 1.4 to 2% over the last seven years. So even that has been a little bit on the light side, even though we're uh, a little bit more uh, positive about where it's running right now. The unemployment rate, as all of you know, is now 3.6%. It's been below the Congressional Budget Office estimate of full employment for two years. And it's even below uh, other more aggressive estimates of full employment. And the U6 measure of unemployment which measures, as you all know, the level of unemployed plus marginally attached workers, people who indicate they'd like to have a job but have stopped looking for one, plus people who work part-time who want to work full-time. This now stands at 7.3%, which is now well below its 2006 pre-recession low of 7.9%. Uh, at the Dallas Fed, we're expecting GDP growth this year to be in the neighborhood of 2 and a quarter percent slower than 2018. But it should be sufficient, we believe, to further tighten the labor market and cause the rate of wage growth to modestly pick up over the course of 2019. We also expect that despite some recent weakness in headline and core inflation readings, the headline PCE and the Dallas trim mean measure of PC inflation are likely to firm, and we do believe we're going to end this year in the neighborhood of 2 percent. Having said all that, many observers rightly say, with this kind of a labor market, there should be and should have been greater wage pressure than the 3.2% average reading we've been seeing of average hourly earnings over the past year. They argue we should have expected more wage pressure, and that should have translated into greater price pressure. With this background, I'm going to set the table for, our, for my three Fed colleagues as they speak. And I'm going to talk about the fact that in light of our ongoing Fed fam framework, uh, I thought it would make sense to step back and explore some of the potential issues raised by the recent weakness in headline and core inflation measures. In particular, I'm going to focus on labor slack, inflation expectations, and third, structural forces with regard to how they may be impacting the Fed's ability to meet its 2% inflation objective. So let me start with labor slack. A number of economists, and some FOMC policymakers have argued that there may be more slack in the U.S. labor market than standard measures have been capturing and are capturing. They believe that there is more scope to attract and retain previously underrepresented groups in the workforce. And to support this argument, it's worth noting that since 2015, increase, increases in labor force participation have disproportionately come from underrepresented groups. For example, the participation rate of the prime age female population with less than a high school education has increased significantly since 2015, as has the participation rate for black males and Hispanic females. It's also worth noting that prime age labor force participation rate is approximately 82 percent versus around 83 percent in 2008 and 84 percent in 1998. And if we compare U.S. prime age labor force participation to other developed countries in the world, 
we find the U.S. participation rate even today lags behind those of those other countries, although this gap has begun to close somewhat since early 2015. So is it possible that the strength of the labor market is drawing in workers who've been on the sidelines, particularly underrepresented groups, and is, is it encouraging those workers to get in the workforce and stay in the labor force? Is it possible that improvements in skills training, childcare availability, transportation availability have drawn and could still draw more sideline workers back into the workforce and keep them in the workforce? It's important to recognize that the gains in labor force participation act to slow the decline of the unemployment rate and research, including work but one done by Richard Crump, Stefano Giuseppe, Mark Giannone of the Dallas Fed, and Isagal Sahin, have argued that changes in demographics, particularly in the aging of the workforce, the aging of firms, as well as the increase in the attachment of women to the workforce, may have contributed to a decline in the natural rate of unemployment. In their paper, they estimate the natural rate of unemployment now at approximately 4.1%. I'm cognizant that we may look back five years from now and conclude that the natural rate of unemployment was simply lower than we'd been historically accustomed, and that one of the reasons the, for the perceived surprising lack of inflation pressure has been due to an excessively high estimate of the equilibrium level of unemployment. It's possible. In this explanation, the Phillips curve may in fact be alive and well, but the intercept is simply lower than we've previously understood. If this is true, central bankers need to be vigilant to the possibility that there still is potential for inflation readings to firm substantially with a time lag if the degree of full employment overshoot becomes more sizable and persists for an extended period of time. Another area to discuss is inflation expectations. As you all know, and we've talked about extensively today, the Fed has clearly articulated a 2% longer run PC inflation target. Many would argue that the Fed's done a reasonably good job in helping to anchor inflation expectations. They would cite the fact that surveys of professional forecasters are close to 2%, and they would suggest it's not a coincidence. It's a reflection of the Federal Open Market Committee's policy actions and communications, which have been aimed at achieving and maintaining full employment while anchoring longer run inflation expectations at our 2% objectives. However, there are other economists that contend that due an extended period of inflation running below our 2% target, expectations may in fact have drifted somewhat lower. This downward drift might be reflected in the University of Michigan survey for inflation expectations over the next five years, which has gone from an average of 2.9% in 2013 to 2.3% in the 12 months ending April 2019 a clear drift lower. These economists argue that the Fed may need to do more to help keep inflation expectations well anchored. Uh, in particular, the question is, has the Fed done enough to convince the public that it's committed to a symmetrical 2% inflation target? John Williams discussed some of this earlier today. My colleagues, I think, will discuss it further. But the question is, are there changes to the Fed's policy framework, communication strategy, or other actions the Fed could take to help better anchor inflation expectations of the 2% target. Third potential area to talk about, structural forces. Um, these in particular are the forces of technology, technology-enabled disruption, and to some extent globalization, which are limiting the pricing power of business and muting inflation. We are living through a period of acceleration in the trend of technology replacing people. This trend isn't new, but I think it is accelerating. We're also, though, seeing the proliferation of new models for selling goods and services, often technology-enabled, think Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, or Lyft, that replace traditional models for delivering these goods and services. These models are, models are enabling consumers to buy products at good, and services at prices dramatically the, below those of incumbent competitors. To take advantage of this trend, large platform companies are increasingly bundling products and services, sometimes with little or no gross margin, in order to gain market share. And oh, by the way, 
uh, if you look at it, you'll notice that there is a substantial amount of market cap that has gone into these companies. They are highly valued. And I would argue that um, the acceleration of uh, the valuation of these companies and their ability to employ the strategies they are employing, in part at least, is due to a very low cost of capital. I'll come back to that later. All this is being facilitated by the fact that the consumer now has in the palm of his or her hand more computing power than most companies did just 15 years ago. We take it for granted, but it is a dramatic structural change in the economy. Consumers are now able to use this technology to shop for goods and services at lower prices, often with greater convenience. The impact of these trends, though, means that companies, depending on their industry, often have much less pricing power than they did historically. In response, companies are investing even more in technology to replace people and increasingly taking actions to achieve greater scale in order to effectively manage the investment and margin implications of these trends. The net result is that in a range of industries, there's wage pressure, and when that occurs, companies are just as likely to see margin erosion versus being able to pass these costs on to the customer. And we're seeing this, by the way, I believe, in corporate earnings reports, and you may have noticed, even though this year S&P 500 earnings are better than expected, they have actually declined from the same period of 2018. So margin pressure is, it's not invisible, it's manifesting itself. As a result of these trends, we're seeing a record level of merger activity by companies in order to get more scale to compete. In addition, companies are using increased debt issuance to fund merger activities to achieve greater scale, and they're also using increased debt issuance to fund accretive share repurchase in order to soften the margin dilution they're experiencing, and in some cases, mask that dilution. Activist investors are increasingly pressuring companies to take steps and merge and fund accretive share repurchase or face replacement of their boards of directors or their executive teams. The workforce is also experiencing the impact of this trend. Highly educated and skilled workers are often seeing the benefits of technology and disruption depending on their company or industry. However, if you're one of the 46 million workers in this country with a high school education or less, you, and you lack specific skills training, you may increasingly be seeing your job restructured or eliminated. This is, leading in, this is leading to a number of the stresses that we're seeing in our economy. This discussion would suggest that powerful structural changes in the economy may be an important aspect of more muted price pressures. Further, there may be some evidence in recent productivity statistics of, regarding productivity that technology and greater economies of scale could be ha helping to dampen growth in unit labor costs. I don't have the answers to exactly uh, the reasons why inflation has been more muted, but I do know uh, that we've got a 2% inflation target at the Fed. We don't want inflation to run persistently below or persistently above our 2% target. And I do know and I believe that sustained deviations from our inflation target could increase the likelihood that inflation expectations begin to drift or become un unanchored, and this in turn may make it more difficult for the Fed to achieve its dual mandate objectives of full employment and price stability. As the Federal Reserve conducts its ongoing review of our monetary policy framework and communication strategy, the challenge will be for us to consider some of these questions and explore potential <coughs> options for enhancing our policy approach so that we can better achieve our dual mandate. Let me just start by saying thank you, John, so much for inviting me, and thank you, Charlie, for, for uh, setting us up on that panel. What I'm going to do uh, today is follow along from Rob's comments and talk about, you know, why review our framework at this time. Well, the first reason is, and I think this is something that gets missed oftentimes, is it's just good practice to review your strategies and tools. The economy changes, and you want to review and revisit these issues. This is something the Bank of Canada does regularly. So I think of this as best practice, even if we weren't facing some of the challenges we have. 
But we are facing some challenges, and those are, you know, we're more likely to hit the zero lower bound going forward. We've heard that many times today. We will frequently find ourselves fighting inflation from below our target as opposed to trying to pull inflation down to our target. And we've been very good at the Fed at anchoring inflation expectations, but it means they matter more now than perhaps they have in the past, or maybe they always mattered, but now we really see it. And so that's going to be important. When I put all these things together, I think it's important, and I heard this today in our discussions, that we really think of, and this is the way I approach it anyway, I think of it as we have three potential states of the world. One, we have inflation that's above our target, and we have a long history of knowing how to bring that down to 2%, and how we have tools and we have history and models that suggest we, we can do it. So that's a world we're used to. The second state of the world is the terrible financial crisis we just came through, and we have an all-hands-on-deck policy, you know, throw every tool you can, learn from those things, but you hope that those financial crises don't happen all the time, so you don't want to necessarily think of the framework review as just an event in the event of this uh, a terrible financial crisis. What we're facing going forward is these factors, these have more likely to hit the effect of lower bound, uh, fighting inflation from below, and having this real high weight on inflation expectations, and that's going to be our new norm for all the reasons that many of the participants here have talked about. So I want to focus on that third state of the world and think about what do we, what's the framework if that's the third state of the world that we're likely to face. Let me just talk about this third state of the world. You know, this is the, when I look out on the policy making space, these are the factors that I think about a lot. First, we're going to have more limited space for fund rates cuts. So we, this is just from the uh, summary of economic projections. And as Vice Chair Clara had mentioned, these have been coming down over time. The star variables have been trending down, whether you're talking about U star, G star, or R star. But this is a plot of R star. This is forward looking in many ways, and it just tells you there's less policy space going forward than we've been accustomed to having in the past, less funds rate space. The second fact that you have to look at if you're thinking about making policy going forward is that for the last number of years, inflation has consistently fallen below our targets, consistently coming in below 2%. And that's true whether you look at PCE or core PCE. So that's something that you know, Rob just mentioned. If you consistently do that, it tugs at the expectations. Even if they're not unanchored today, there's a lot of pressure to tie them to the anchor as, as John and, and Thomas talked about in their paper. Another fact that comes from research done by some colleagues at the San Francisco Fed is that inflation expectations matter more today than they used to. So this just compares 1997 through 2007 to 2008 through 2018. And what it shows you is if you decompose it into persistence versus inflation expectations, the persistence term is falling and the inflation expectations is rising. So in terms of worrying about inflation expectations, we always have, but this is where they're more important now than they have been in the past, partly reflecting the success of our credibility, but also something to think about when you wonder if that anchor is going to drift at all. So if you put those three things together, and that's the future you face, then it's important to think about strategies and how do you achieve target inflation going forward. Now, I've listed three viable alternative strategies when you're at the executive, um, the executive, the effective lower bound. Uh, it's late in the day. I'm thinking <laughs> of executives. I don't know. Um, nominal income targeting, price level targeting, and average inflation targeting. And I've obviously left out other things we talked about earlier today, such as negative interest rate policies. But I'm going to focus on these uh, three types of uh, strategies, alternatives, because they have something in common. Now, this is a very stylized picture of what John showed earlier from the paper that he and Thomas did. They had actual simulations. I'll have those in a moment. But these, the point I'm going to make here is that the three strategies I just named, average inflation targeting, nominal income targeting, price level targeting, they're all meant to have a makeup component to them that's different than our symmetric inflation targeting policy today. So this simply shows that if you get a shock, so we have a positive uh, aggregate demand shock, and you end up with uh, inflation rising above your target, if you're symmetric inflation targeting, you simply bring this back to two. If you're away from two, you come back to two. But if you have average inflation targeting in one of these other strategies, you want to make up for that past miss, and you want to, in this case, uh, disinflate. So if you, so that's the makeup strategy, and this goes you know, forward through positive aggregate demand shocks, negative aggregate 
demand shocks. So this is what makeup policies are meant to do. They're meant to offset past misses, and that's very different than a symmetric inflation target, which we operate with now. Now, if you think about these three, average inflation targeting, price level targeting, and nominal income targeting, and I have to admit I've been thinking about these a lot, then they have to have other, there's other ways to evaluate them, and, and this has been mentioned earlier. One of the things that is important is they have to be able to communicate. And I would argue uh, that if you just think about it, average inflation targeting would be a little bit easier to communicate than nominal income targeting or price level targeting, simply because we have people trained more or less to think of us having a 2% target, and this is about how to execute on that target. Changing to price or nominal income level targeting, that's just harder. So for that reason, I'm gonna focus on average inflation targeting, but also Jim's gonna talk about nominal income targeting, so we'll, you'll have all of the, of the parts. But even if you choose an average inflation target as your, as your strategy, there are many open questions. Many, some of them have been mentioned here today, but I've got a list. First of all, what is the window length over which you need to average? Do you really need to fully offset so that you need to commit potentially past the length or the survivors of the committee? If your committee's changing, you know, how long do you have to commit for this to be successful? Another uh, important question is, does this even work if uh, agents in the economy are backward looking and not forward looking, since so much of this rests on expectations? The other, another part is, does it matter if people are, do or don't participate in financial markets? <clears throat> and then would, would uh, an average inflation strategy be credible? Could we really deliver on credibility? And of course, should it be temporary or permanent? So let me take on those uh, types of questions using a framework developed by my colleague, uh, Sylvain Duke and his co-authors, Amano and Yoki. And what they do, it's very similar to what uh, Thomas and John did in that they just take a simple model. So the, the point here is to be illustrative, not quantitative, but it, it gives us, the, the illustrative part tells us some stack rankings of these different strategies. So in their particular um, model here that I'm gonna focus on, 20% of the households have no access to financial markets, 75% of firms are backward looking, and the ex effective lower bound binds at 20% uh, 20, 20 of the time. So you've got, those are your like parameterizations. Then the central bank is simply trying to minimize inflation and output gaps, and in this uh, framework it's going to use an average inflation rule to do that. Minimize average inflation around a number of years. And the question is, if you have a, a fee of 1.5, how many quarters does it take? and they ran a various uh, numbers of simulations and they come up with, well, let's six is a good number, six quarters, so one and a half years. And the question is, what do you get from this six quarters? If that's all you did it, what would you get? Importantly, and I'll mention this a bit later too, is that this is really just hitting the effective lower bound and coming back up. It's not staying persistently on the effective lower bound like we did during the financial crisis. So to do this, let's start with just the baseline of inflation targeting. This is a picture we're all accustomed to seeing. You get a, a shock, output goes down, inflation goes down, and it's uh, slow to recover because we're at the zero lower bound in this picture. So we're at the zero lower bound, you get a shock, output goes down, and inflation takes a while to come back. So what happens if you have average inflation targeting using the model framework that I just described? Well, in the, mo in the model framework they have, output recovers a little more quickly, but the important thing is that inflation recovers much more quickly. And that's all because of the inflation, ex the expectations term. This is all acting through the expectations term. Agents in the economy know the Fed is gonna commit to average inflation targeting, that they're gonna get to 2%. They see that they're forward looking and they, they that inflation, one, it acts as a shock absorber. You don't go down as much because you know it's gonna come back up, so you're not gonna affect pricing decisions and other things. And two, the Fed is working on this, so you, you stay at this uh, target. The other thing I'd like to, that, I, that I've th thought about a lot is how does this compare to price level targeting in the same framework with a full makeup strategy? And that's the third uh, line. And if you have a full makeup strategy and price level targeting, average inflation targeting in this framework that they've <coughs> developed does fairly well. There's not a lot of difference. And if it's slightly easier or a lot easier to communicate, then this might be the dominant strategy. Now, as I mentioned, this is a stylized model. Right now in this model, they're only hitting the zero lower bound 
episodically and not persistently staying there. But if you expand it in simulations or robustness checks, if you say you're at the zero lower bound for two to three years, then it means your average inflation target window isn't six quarters, it's more like you know two to three years. So if you're at the ZLB two years, it's a three year target window. But still, that's not, I was very worried or thoughtful about this, worried is probably too strong, about would it be 10 years? You know, how long do we have to go to really get this? And so these model simulations say something on the order of uh, six quarters if it's a, a slight time at the ZLB and something like three years if it's a longer time. So let me conclude though by talking about some other things that are also very important, it's credibility. This does not work unless there's credibility because it all comes through the expectations term. That's why you get the big win. So you have to have credibility in order for this to be effective. And I would argue that that calls for a needing to adopt it before you hit the effective lower bound, not when you hit the effective lower bound. Because you lose some of the, the powder you have in this, in this methodology if you wait. It also implies, and this is the challenging part, really challenging part, it implies that we're going to have to have a willingness to disinflate if necessary. And that can be challenging for two reasons. One, it's not always popular, but two, we may not find ourselves with that many episodes of an opportunistic uh, opportunity to disinflate. So, you know, how do we get credibility when that's before us? I will only say that credibility is, takes time to earn. Credibility was not something the Fed had immediately when we had the Volcker disinflation. It took a long time. So standing in 2019 and saying we feel like we have credibility is very different than what we've heard a lot today and even in the historical presentation where it just takes time to earn it. So I, I don't think that we should be pushed off by the fact that credibility is challenging, but you have to be intentional about making sure that that's the policy and then going after it and recognizing it takes a little bit of time. So in summary, the, with the Fed objectives uh, met, you know, we're close to our price uh, to inflation target and we've got full employment. At this point, we're, we're, our the economy's in a good state. It becomes a really good time to look at our framework and I argued that was best <coughs> practice anyway. I find the average inflation targeting an attractive option, not just for the work that's being done in San Francisco, but also John and Thomas's paper earlier. But credibility keeps coming back as the important thing. I do think, and, and this was something Secretary Schultz said, that the bar for change is high. So it's not simply that, well, this might work in theory and we've got some simulations, so yeah, why not, let's do it. The bar is really high because it can be costly to make mistakes in this space. But this kind of framework and all the things we've heard today, the discussion, the debate, the simulations, and many more pieces of research is needed in order for us to make sure we can deliver on the dual mandate goals for the American people. <coughs> Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much, and thanks to you all for being here. Thanks for, to uh, the Hoover Institution and Stanford University and John Taylor for sponsoring this conference, which I see is very complimentary to our framework review this year. And uh, I think we're learning a lot and, and doing a lot to assess uh, what's going on uh, that might help us uh, make better monetary policy for the U.S. going forward. Um, this is going to be an advertisement for a paper. Uh, the good part is there actually is a paper. Uh, <laughs> it's called Optimal Monetary Policy for the Masses. Uh, it's joint work with Ricardo De Ceccio. Um, you can go to my webpage and, and look it up, and it, it does talk about uh, uh, nominal GDP targeting in a specific, uh, in a specific framework. Now, uh, Mike Woodford's uh, Jackson Hole talk in 2012 has been referenced here today already. Uh, he talked about uh, nominal GDP targeting as being the right sort of forward commitment that the uh, that the central bank needs to make in order to ha uh, have a better monetary policy and in particular to handle monetary policy at the zero lower bound. I'm going to look at nominal GDP targeting here as optimal monetary policy in a different uh, type of model. It's going to be one that you're not used to. Part of this comes from my thinking that the profession is overcommitted to the new Keynesian framework, as beautiful as it is, and as much as I've written papers about it, uh, we do you know, practically everything in that particular uh, 
context. There are other models out there in the world, so let's see uh, what we get out of other models. Now, the models are going to be different, but the policy recommendation is similar. And because of that, I think you might conclude or you might be tempted to conclude that nominal GDP targeting might be a pretty robust way to approach uh, optimal monetary policy in worlds with nominal the kinds of nominal frictions that we want to talk about. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can stimulate more research uh, with the model presented here. I, I certainly wouldn't take it directly to policy today, but, it cer but on the other hand, I think it is promising. And I, I would say that uh, just generally about the discussion going on today and about the framework that what I see happening is that ideas in central banking are gradually shifting and some of the ideas get brought into the policy discussion, and that's how frameworks change over longer periods of time. So I think that's more, uh, gives you a better picture maybe of what might happen here as opposed to all of a sudden the Fed's gonna like switch to a different framework on, the, on a particular day. All right, so uh, what do we do in this paper? Um, it's a stylized economy. Uh, we're going to make simplifying assumptions that are going to make this be paper and pencil solutions. Uh, there are going to be private credit markets that are critical, and there's going to be a whole lot of heterogeneity in this economy, which is uh, something I'm, uh, I want to emphasize and I want all of us to work on more because I think heterogeneous, agent, uh, house, or heterogeneous agents are an important frontier for macroeconomics. And the role of monetary policy is going to be to make sure that these private credit markets work well, uh, complete markets, and it's going to look like nominal GDP targeting. And the, I guess the main point of this paper, there are companion papers to this one, but the main point of this one is this result holds even when there's a whole lot of heterogeneity in the economy, enough to match the Gini coefficients uh, for the U.S. economy. So I'll show you a pic, uh, chart of that uh, later in this talk. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just basically uh, advertise a model with two slides talking about the construct, and then I'm going to show you pictures, and then I'll be done. So uh, this is going to be an overlapping generations uh, structure. I don't think you should take life and death, so literally uh, we're going to just keep track of people uh, only when they're age 20. We're not going to keep track of them before then, and we're going to keep tr quit keeping track of them uh, when they get to age 80. And they're going to live for quarters. So they're going to live for 241 uh, quarters so that we can talk about a quarterly model. Uh, sometimes when people do OLG, they start thinking long-run issues, but I want to think business cycle issues. So we're going to do it at the quarterly frequency. These households are going to have log-log uh, preferences for those that defined over consumption and leisure, uh, so very simple preference structure. And the key fe feature of this is that when you come into this model at age 20, you're going to be assigned, randomly assigned, a productivity profile over your lifetime. And this productivity profile is going to start low. It's going to rise up exactly in the middle of life and peak in the middle of life, and then it's going to go down to the previous level. So it's going to have this symmetry uh, feature to it that's going to help us with the math. And um, we're going to draw these for the incoming cohort, the uh, continuum of agents in the incoming cohort. We're going to draw this from a uniform distribution, and I'll show you some pictures. But you could draw this from a, a log normal distribution, so you'd have arbitrarily poor and arbitrarily rich households. So yes, Elon Musk would be in this uh, economy if we did the log, nor log normal uh, distribution. Um, the productivity units then that you have at every stage of your life can be sold on a competitive market at an at a economy-wide wa uh, wage. Um, aggregate production is linear. Economy grows over time at a stochastic rate. So there's a shock, aggregate shock here. For those of you that are technically minded, a few students in here, this is a heterogeneous agent economy with an aggregate shock that you can solve with pencil and paper. So that's the uh, technical side of this uh, that's interesting. You can also do the effective lower bound on this. I'm not going to talk about it here. You have to go to the companion paper uh, for that. So what's going on in this economy? Well, uh, they're peak earning years, and uh, uh, the young people aren't earning very much, but they want to pull consumption forward in the life cycle, so they want to borrow. Uh, and the people that are middle-aged want to save for retirement, so they lend to the young people. So you get this big 
uh, household credit market, you could think of the services that are being pulled forward in life cycle by younger households as uh, uh, housing services, and you could think of the one asset in this economy as being mortgage-backed securities. Uh, mortgage-backed securities in the U.S. are about nine trillion today, maybe ten trillion. Household debt total is about thirteen point five trillion uh, today. So this is a big private credit market that's out there in the real world. There's going to be something wrong in this credit market, uh, as there is in the real world. There's non-state contingent nominal contracting, which means that the contracts are set up in nominal terms and they're not contingent on uh, any shocks that occur in the economy or uh, among the borrowers and lenders. Um, there are two parts to that. The resources are misallocated because of the uh, non-state contingency. And the fact that it's nominal means that the policymaker, the monetary policymaker, might be able to do something about that and might be able to fix this uh, problem in the credit market. Okay, so enough about the uh, structure. Let's just go to what do you get out of this? Um, the, uh, you get a monetary policy that follows a, a nominal GDP targeting rule. It delivers complete markets consumption allocations, which means it essentially cancels out the uncertainty for the households going forward. So it's a form of insurance for the households, uh, similar to uh, findings from Evan Koenig, who is here. So uh, if you don't like my explanations, just ask Evan uh, about it. Uh, Kevin Sheedy also has a great paper on this. Uh, one thing out of the Sheedy paper, non-state contingent nominal contracting, nine times more important than the sticky price friction according to his calibrated model. So that's food for thought. So um, what happens is that the, uh, this induces, this, this policy induces equity share contracting, which means uh, we all get our own slice of the pie no matter how much we produce uh, or how much we get paid on a given day. Uh, we all consume the same amounts because the borrowing and lending works perfectly uh, in this economy, uh, provided the policymaker pursues optimal policy. Um, it's a stochastic economy, so I'm going to show you kind of uh, cross-sectional pictures, but you know, consumption does move around and wages move around, everything moves around, uh, but uh, all in proportion to the real wage. And then uh, household consumption growth is equalized across all these agents, rich and poor, young and old. Everybody's going to get the same consumption growth rate, and it's going to be equal to the aggregate uh, growth rate. So this is going to have uh, really nice properties. Uh, real interest rate is exactly equal to the output growth rate at every date, even in the stochastic economy. Uh, that's the key theorem in the paper. This is actually uh, the real business cycle economy that's underlying this model. Uh, so. Ed Prescott is here, he'll be happy about that. Uh, but you can only get there by uh, pursuing the optimal monetary policy. You could also think of this as the Wixellian natural rate of interest. So what the optimal policy is doing is getting you back to the Wixellian natural rate of interest. The natural rate of interest is the one that would occur if there was no frictions in the economy, which is the case in the Kidlin Prescott uh, economy. So in that sense, the new Keynesian policy advice and the policy advice coming out of here are exactly the same thing. You want to get the interest rate to be an undistorted uh, interest rate in the economy, the real interest rate. Um, because of the preferences we have, <coughs> all households, rich and poor, will work exactly the same number of hours uh, at, different, at each stage of the life cycle. So in these pictures, uh, the pictures go from 0 to 240. That's the quarters that you live. But look, think of this as cross-section. At any point in time, there's, some, there's a cohort that's just entering the economy. That's the 0 over there on the left. And there's a, there are other cohorts, like the 120 is the guy right in the middle, and so on. So the blue line says that people work more in the middle of the life cycle, and they work almost nothing at the beginning and end of life cycle. We actually ruled out corner solutions here. But they work very little at the beginning of end and end without retiring. Um, so, doctors work 40 hours a week, taxi drivers work 40 hours a week, everybody works 40 hours a week in the middle of the life cycle because that's when you have your productivity and you better work while the sun shines. So what happens is that the credit market reallocates the uneven income. So people are going to work more in the middle of life. They're also more productive in the middle of life. So you get this blue mass here, that's the income uh, <coughs> section. <laughs> 
<coughs> point in time in this economy, the labor earnings, labor earnings doesn't show capital earnings, just labor earnings <coughs> at a point in time, it's very uneven over the life cycle, but the red bar uh, and the red box shows uh, all these different agents, how much they're consuming. So the way to think of this is imagine a family of doctors, young doctor, middle-aged doctor, grandfather's a doctor, <coughs> everybody's a doctor. But uh, the, only the middle-aged doctor is actually earning a lot of income. The young doctor is still in medical school and the old doctor <coughs> is retired, and yet they're all consuming exactly the same amount because the credit market's working perfectly. So they are the very top of the red box there. Um, <coughs> Uh, you could say the same thing about a family of taxi drivers, old taxi driver, middle-aged taxi driver, and young taxi driver. The, only the middle-aged guys earning any income, but they're all consuming exactly the same amount. So if you're on the same life cycle productivity profile, you're going to consume the same amount uh, no matter what, where you are in the <coughs> age uh, distribution. These things shift up over time because this is a growing economy, but this is the basic story here. So the blue line would show a typical guy in the middle. Um, uh, and uh, the red line would show the tip of the consumption associated with that. The, now we're going to calculate Gini coefficients here of labor income and uh, and consumption. So that would be off this off these uh, shaded regions here. And this is my favorite picture: the net asset holding mass in this uh, in this economy. Uh, and maximum indebtedness occurs around period 60, that's like age 35, so you'd be buying your house at that point. Uh, maximum savings is around period 180, that's age 65 in this model, you run down your assets. You're going to calculate the Gini coefficient off here, it's going to be on the right hand side of this picture because we're only counting positive financial wealth. So. <laughs> if you look in the U.S. data of financial wealth, Gini is about a point, uh, 80 percent, income Gini 51, consumption Gini 32. The model naturally ranks these Genies. If we can get the income Gini and consumption Gini almost exactly right, we're a little shy on the wealth Gini, which is typical of uh, these kinds of models. So <laughs> we do very well in Gini coefficients, even with a very simple, straightforward approach to um, uh, income inequality. So people say, Jim, why is this nominal GDP targeting? And I tell them, I say, if that shocks were IID, then you would actually stay exactly on a nominal GDP path at every single date. So it would actually be perfect nominal GDP targeting. If you have uh, some serial correlation in the shocks, then you're going to go up and up and down around this path, but you're basically going to be returning to the nominal GDP path all the time. And then people worry also, does this policy look weird somehow? So I'm going to show you a picture that says it does not. Uh, the policy, actual policy kind of looks like what central banks already do. Uh, both nominal and real rates fall in recession. So let me talk to you through this, this picture and then we'll get to the conclusions. So up on the upper left is the uh, shock in the model, the lambda, uh, let's say that's growing at 2%, but you get a shock on date one, so it declines and then gradually returns to its mean. So that's the shock in the model. Um, the uh, key to this is the nominal interest rate there in the upper right-hand corner. It does not fall in the period of the shock. That's the key to nominal GDP targeting. The classic feature of nominal GDP targeting is in the bottom right corner where inflation goes up in the period of the shock, but then subsequently inflation falls, nominal interest rates fall, uh, real interest rate is below its long run level. All those features look just like uh, what you would see out of uh, a typical model. <coughs> so. I don't think it looks all that different um, depending on what you think about the um, nominal interest rate does not fall exactly in the period of the shock. It falls one period <laughs> after the shock. All right, so let's uh, finish up. Uh, this is a uh, uh, baseline benchmark type model that could be expanded in many directions. Um, it's based on the idea that actual households have peak earning years. They have to use credit markets to smooth life cycle consumption. Um, there's a friction in that market, non-state contingent nominal contracting, and the Monetary Authority can fix that friction. Uh, 
the way they fix that friction is by restoring the Wixellian natural rate of interest uh, in the model. <coughs> the real business cycle people in here, that's the rate of growth of technology, stochastic rate of growth of technology. And uh, the thing about this is the basic message is even though there's a lot of heterogeneity in this economy, there are arbitrarily rich people and arbitrarily poor people, they all need the credit markets to smooth life cycle consumption. So you want the credit market to work well, this is a way to get the credit market to work well and fix the friction in that market. So it's optimal monetary policy for the masses. Thanks very much. <coughs> okay, thank, I also want to thank John Taylor for inviting me to participate in the conference. It's been a really good day for me. And it's also a real pleasure to uh, be on a panel moderated by Charles Foster, who I worked at, at the Philly Fed. Um, Charles, I did learn a lot from you, but I, I have to say that the views I'll present are my own and not necessarily those uh, of my fellow panelists here or other colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee or the Federal Reserve System. So in my short time, I'm not going to repeat what's been said today about the FOMC's <coughs> flexible inflation targeting framework, which I think has served us well, or the reasons it's sensible for the FOMC to undertake a review of its strategic framework at this time. Um, I do believe, as Mary said, that the review is a matter of good governance um, and a prudent thing to do also, given that the post-crisis economic environment is expected <coughs> to differ in some important ways from the pre-crisis world, in particular with lower equilibrium interest rates and a higher chance that we're going to be um, constrained by the zero lower bound. So a number of suggestions have been made for alternative uh, monetary policy frameworks that potentially offer some benefits in a low interest rate environment. We talked about a number of them today. These include price level targeting, nominal GDP targeting, <coughs> targeting average inflation, or <coughs> temporary price level targeting. Um, an idea that's received somewhat less attention is also defining the inflation goal in terms of a range centered on 2% rather than a point target. Now, although these alternative frameworks have theoretical appeal, none of them is without implementation challenges. For example, many of them work well in models of perfect credibility and commitment, and we've talked about that today, where the public understands the framework and believes uh, future committees will follow through, and the committee actually does follow through, implying that the committee has control of inflation expectations. And whether these assumptions would hold in practice is, I think, an open question. One needs to ask whether it's credible for policymakers to commit to keep interest rates low, to make up for past shortfalls of inflation from target, even when demand is growing strongly, or to act to bring inflation down in the face of a supply shock by tightening policy, even in the face of weak demand. So it's not actually clear what actually would happen to inflation expectations in these scenarios, despite what's assumed in the models. So that makes this evaluation you know, going to be uh, somewhat complex. We're going to have to evaluate the assumptions that drive the theoretical appeal of each framework and determine whether in practice the net benefits of any of the alternatives will outweigh those of the flexible inflation targeting framework. And if not, what if any enhancements should be made to our current framework? Now, regardless of the framework the FOMC ultimately decides on, the public's expectation of future monetary policy are an important part of the transmission mechanism of policy to the economy. And this means effective communication will be an essential component of the framework. And this is something that Charles Plosser mentioned in his opening remarks. So I believe there are ways we can enhance our communications about our policy approach that would make any framework more effective. So I'm going to talk about three of them. First, let's clarify how monetary policy affects the economy and which aspects of the economy can be influenced by monetary policy and which aspects cannot. So policy is more effective when the public's and market participants' policy expectations are aligned with our policy decisions. But before this alignment can occur, the public needs to have a basic understanding of our monetary policy goals and what monetary policy can achieve and what it cannot. So my concern is that this understanding has diminished since the Great Recession. Regardless of the framework, the FOMC strategy document 
is going to need to articulate the relationship between monetary policy and our two policy goals of price stability and maximum employment. And I think we should clarify that over the longer run, monetary policy can affect only inflation and not the underlying real structural aspects of the economy, such as the long run natural rate of employment, unemployment, or maximum employment. Now, this concept is touched on in our current monetary policy strategy document, but I don't think the public fully understands. Indeed, former Chair Janet Yellen had to explain in one of her post-FOMC meeting press conferences that in an earlier speech, she did not mean to imply that she favored running a high-pressure economy as an experiment to affect longer-run growth and unemployment. So I think we could do a better job of explaining how monetary policy promotes the economy's growing up potential and operating at maximum employment. In particular, we tend to move our policy rate up when resource utilization tightens and down when resource utilization eases in order to bring our policy rate into alignment with the economy's natural rate of interest, which does change over the business cycle as the economy adjusts to shocks. So there doesn't have to be an exploitable Phillips curve trade-off between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate in order for policymakers to want to respond to changes in the unemployment rate, which is an indicator of resource utilization. So the response is not an attempt to actively use monetary policy to affect the longer-run growth rate of the economy or longer-run unemployment rate. Now, I think a benefit of explaining things in this way makes it clear that the FOMC is not trying to rob the economy of jobs when it raises interest rates. And another benefit is that it should allay concerns that because the empirical Phillips curve is flattened, that monetary policy has become anemic. I think improving the public's understanding of how monetary policy works and what it can achieve would help not only in normal times, but also in bad times. The Great Recession was an enormous negative shock, some part of which was likely permanent or at least very persistent rather than transitory. I don't think monetary policy should have been expected to make up for that permanent loss, and I think fiscal policy should have taken on a larger part of the burden. The second thing we should clarify is how uncertainty is accounted for in monetary policy making and incorporate this uncertainty into monetary policy strategy to avoid to avoid giving a false sense of precision. Now, according to Voltaire, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but certainty is an absurd one. I like that <laughs> quote. Because uh, in this context, that means it's important to convey that monetary policy policymakers have to deal with uncertainty in several forms. And this is something that Mickey Levy uh, touched on in his remarks. It has, monetary policy has to be forward-looking because it affects the economy with a lag but the economy is buffeted by shocks that can lead economic conditions to evolve differently than anticipated. Moreover, our view of economic conditions in real time can be cloudy because the data come in with a lag, and many economic data are revised over time. And of course, in addition, which we talked about today, there's, there's a lot of model uncertainty. So the public needs to understand that given the lags and revisions in the data, Incoming information can alter not only the policymaker's view of the expected future evolution of the economy, but also his or her understanding of current and past economic conditions. New information could alter the expected future policy path and might even result in ex post regret of a recent action. So Bob Hetzel, um, an economist who was at the Richmond Fed, says that policymaker has a flavor of guess and correct. It's a normal part of monetary policy making that policymakers will always be learning about whether their policy settings are the appropriate ones to promote their goals. Now, the public has to hold the FOMC accountable for its performance, but it should not hold monetary policymakers to an unrealistic standard. I think the FOMC took an important step in communicating uncertainty when it began showing 70% uncertainty bands around the median projections of FOMC participants. But these are not emphasized. And it, in fact, like Mickey Levy suggested a, a picture that we actually do release, um, but in the minutes. Um, and I think these uncertainty bands deserve more attention and should be released at the time of the post FOMC press conference. I think they are a good illustration of the reasonable amount of deviation to expect between projections and outcomes. Now, 
Some have argued, and we've heard this today, that the FOMC's projections of appropriate monetary policy, the so-called dot plot, should be dropped because actual policy can differ from the projections. So I think that would be a mistake. Um, I think the dots can change over time because of economic developments, but in my view, that's a design feature, not a flaw. I think omitting the dot plot would not eliminate the uncertainty around the projections, the divergence in views across FOMC participants, or the fact that policymaking always entails learning and recalibration, but I do think dropping it would be a significant step back in transparency. So I think we need to recognize uncertainty in our broader monetary policy strategy as well. Consider the FOMC's inflation target. After much deliberation, the committee chose a point target instead of a range and a total inflation measure instead of a core measure. Now, there were arguments on both sides, um, but the committee was persuaded that a point target would better anchor inflation expectations. Implicit in that choice was that the committee would tolerate small deviations from target given the precision with which inflation can be measured, the pre precision with which we can guide the economy with monetary policy, and the typical revisions to the PC inflation measures, which tend to be revised up over time. So I think it's interesting to think through whether our policy choices or communications since 2012 might have differed had the committee opted for a range rather than a point target, as some other central banks do, and for a core measure rather than a total measure of inflation. And I think these data revision and measurement issues, as well as potential difficulties in maintaining anchored inflation expectations during the periods of higher inflation meant to make up for periods of lower inflation and vice versa, would seem to be amplified in price level targeting and nominal GDP targeting frameworks. So I think that's something we need to think carefully about in our framework review. The third thing we should clarify is our monetary policy um, strategy, should, to, to, to clarify our monetary policy strategy is to take a more systematic approach to our policy decisions and in how we communicate those decisions. And we talked a lot about that today. So households, businesses, and investors make economic and financial decisions based on their expectations of the future, including the future course of monetary policy. And the FOMC strives to avoid surprising the public with its policy decisions. So the communications challenge for the FOMC is to give the public a good sense of how policy is likely to respond conditional on how the economy evolves without implying that policy is pre-committed to a particular policy path regardless of how the economy evolves. So essentially the FOMC needs to convey the strategy it uses to determine its policy actions over time to promote achievement of its policy goals. The, the, that is, its reaction function. And this would be true regardless of whichever monetary policy framework the FOMC ultimately adopts. So it's somewhat ironic that the FOMC strategy doc document, if you actually look at it, doesn't offer that much in the way of strategy. Um, and I think this can lead to misunderstanding that our policy decisions are discretionary when they're actually not. I think the term data dependent also um, which has been used to explain the FOMC's policy making strategy and, and has some good points about it, but I also think that the term can be potentially misinterpreted as suggesting that policy will react to every short run change in the data rather than the accumulation of changes that affect the median run outlook. So I think a more systematic approach to setting monetary policy can better align the public's policy expectations with policy decisions and help to reduce some of the uncertainty around how we actually conduct monetary policy. I think it can help insulate monetary policy from short-run political considerations, and it can also offer more policy continuity over time as committee members change. In a time of rising public skepticism about experts, which can undermine public trust in the institution, being systematic will help the public understand how our decisions are actually made which can enhance the Fed's credibility. Of course, the question is how to ensure that we are setting policy systematically and how to convey this to the public. So I have three suggestions. 
First, while judgment will likely always be a part of policymaking, simple monetary policy rules can play a more prominent role in our policy deliberations and communications. Now, the FOMC has been reluctant to relinquish policymaking to following a simple rule because, frankly, no rule works well enough across a variety of economic models and circumstances. But the Board of Governors, and this was pointed out by Vice Chair Clarita, has begun to include a discussion of rules as benchmarks in the monetary policy report. And the frameworks that we've been talking about um, that try to build in some commitments and constraints on future policy actions, such as price level targeting and average inflation targeting and nominal GDP targeting are being discussed and they all build in some rule behavior. So I think this means that systematic policymaker is garnering more support. So as a first step, we could select a few benchmark rules that have been shown to yield good economic outcomes and use these rules as reference points to aid policy discussions and communicating why our policy may or may not differ from the rules policy uh, descriptions. I think that could go a long way in ensuring that our decisions are derived in a systematic way and could help us explain our own policy reaction function to the public. The second suggestion is to enhance our own FOMC projections by asking the participants to provide a set of economic projections conditioned on a common policy path, in addition to the current projections, which are conditioned on each individual participant's view of appropriate policy. So this common path might come from a policy rule. I think this would be a step toward achieving a coherent consensus FOMC forecast which has been a challenge, but which could serve as the benchmark for understanding the FOMC's policy actions and post-meeting statements, a recommendation I've made in the past. And my third suggestion to help communicate systematic policymaking is to make our post-meeting FOMC statement consistent from meeting to meeting and less focused on short-room changes in the data released between FOMC meetings and more focused on the meeting run outlook and a consistent set of indicators on inflation, inflation expectations, the unemployment rate, employment growth, output growth, and financial conditions. Each statement could provide the rationale for the policy decision in terms of how accumulated changes in this consistent set, set of economic and financial conditions have or have not influenced the committee's assessment of the factors relevant for policy, that is, the arguments in our reaction function. The statement would also consistently articulate the committee's assessment of risk to the outlook and other considerations that the committee is taking into account in determining current and future policy. And this assessment would be informed by the analysis of alternative forecast scenarios which are discussed at each FOMC meeting. If we provided more consistency about the conditions we systematically assess in calibrating the stance of policy, <laughs> public and market participants would get a better sense of the FOMC's reaction function over time, and their policy expectations would better align with those of policymakers. And my final comment is that I note that all of these suggestions I've made today are relevant regardless of the framework the FOMC ultimately decides to use for setting monetary policy. Thank you. Great, what a terrific panel and sets of issues raised. So uh, we'll open it up for questions for a little bit now and I'd be happy to, uh, the mic's around. Andy. <clears throat> wow, it's a really awesome panel. Thank you, all of you, for your comments and explanations. Um, two quick comments. One, kind of earning credibility. I mean, um, Mike Porto and Chris Erstig, I have a, a paper we wrote a long time ago about this. You know, when we were looking at the Volcker disinflation and other disinflations, and the idea was you can kind of be tough up front to kind of prove you're serious, and then you kind of gradually gain credibility. What I worry about with these makeup strategies, in particular at the, at the lower bound, is their promises about the future, and there is no way to gain credibility up front because you're at the zero bound. <laughs> You usually the shock happens pretty quickly and you're very quickly driven to the zero bound and you can't gain credibility until much later. Now I was thinking about this quote, he who hesitates is lost. If the public doesn't believe the commitment at, well you're at the zero bound, 
then you don't want to carry it through later because it was pointless. You didn't get any gain. Why, why would you do that? And, and so there's an equilibrium here where they know that. You know they know that. <laughs> and so the whole thing kind of, it seems very fragile. And, and I, I think Mary maybe said this earlier. You were, you were saying, well, worried or concerned. I would lose sleep at night. I would lose sleep at night worrying that this fragile strategy is the one that the U.S. economy is depending on working. Now, my other, I, got, I, I should phrase, the next one I'll make is, that was a statement, but I guess <laughs> I, it is a question, because I'd like to hear your, uh, your responses uh, up to it. But let me, let me ask a real question. This morning, when we were talking about negative interest rates, and Mike made the point that usually what happens is small central banks try things first, inflation targeting, you know, it, it was a long, long time before the FOMC was comfortable doing it. And we think, oh, well, maybe that's what will happen with digital cash. Um, the nominal GDP targeting and the average inflation targeting um, are totally untried. They're totally untested, and particularly at the zero bound. And so but the extent to which the FOMC usually is very cautious, I, I honestly don't understand why, why Jim and Mary in particular, maybe John Williams could address this too, why on that particular thing is the FOMC so much more willing to take a totally untried and untrusted strategy where on some other things, um, it's kind of off the table? Anybody wanna? Uh, I, I actually agree that uh, you'd be a world leader. You'd be taking the world's top economy and experimenting with a new strategy. You'd want to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> about doing that, so I agree with that. Um, that was also my argument earlier about why I really don't want the U.S. to be the first country to move off the 2% international standard uh, on inflation targeting. That took decades to get that consensus, and you would unleash chaos in global uh, foreign exchange markets, I think, if you did that. Um, I think I totally agree with you. We should show the same willingness to be willing to think about uh, electronic cash. And I ac actually think there's more going on in the Fed maybe than, than you appreciate, that people are thinking about this. But, um, you know, like nominal GDP targeting, they're not ready to commit to it. Yeah. I'll just add one thing, that thinking about things, so we just saw John Williams, myself, uh, Jim, but many others, thinking about these things, that's what we should be doing. That's very different than choosing to change the operating framework, and that's why the bar is high. I, I, think the, I don't think all those things are contradictory. Uh, discussing and debating is what we should be doing. John Cochran. Uh. So all of these strategies are ways of implementing forward guidance. They rely on this idea that expectations far in the future have stimulative effects today. And, and they also rely on, as long as your instrument is the short-term rate, a Fed chair has to go to Congress and say, look, I know that the short-term rate should be X today, looking at the economy today, but I'm going to set it much lower for quite a while because I promised you a couple of years ago that that's what I was going to do in order to stimulate demand back then, and so I'm making good of my promises, even though it's not the right thing to do for the economy today. That would be tough. The Fed had a chance, in fact. There was uh, you know, a long period of talking about lower for longer and forward guidance and so forth, and then in the couple, starting a couple of years ago, the Fed was quite slow to raise rates and, and got a lot of heat for that, Nobody went to Congress and said, we're deliberately holding rates lower than we should be because we want to make good on those forward guidance projects. You know, it's a very hard thing to do. Now, let me turn that positive. I, I think in response to Andy, there is a way to do it, which is to, to gain your reputation on the other side. If inflation goes above target, you can get some reputation by saying, no, then we're, we're going to keep going and bring the price level back where it was, though that is more painful than otherwise would be the case. That would be good. And I think the reason you're talking about these things is that, that Loretta's idea of we're going to make this a strategy with lots of judgment is not going to work. To tie yourself to the mast this way, you're going to have to really tie yourself to the mast and be much more tied to the rule than, than you would otherwise want to be. It's the only way to go before Congress and say, we're holding them deliberately low, even though inflation's getting out of control. You have to kind of make this much more mechanical than you otherwise would be, which you don't want to do for lots of good reasons. Mike Boyle. 
other hands hold. Okay, um, okay this, I guess this is <clears throat> for Mary and, and Robert. Um, so about 15 years ago, I wrote uh, some papers on deflation. Uh, I did one with Andy Filardo, who's here, and some other people. And we looked at uh, good versus bad, and good meant productivity driven, and bad meant collapses in aggregate demand. And what we found was that if you look over like 150 years in 20 countries, et cetera, that there were a lot of episodes like that, and they lasted for a really long time of, of good deflation, I'm talking about with productivity. And so if that's the case, let's say we're, we may be going into one of those situations now. This relates to what Rob said. So then, like, how, how does this affect your strategy? It seems like inflation targeting that we're using right now isn't really going to work and maybe price level targeting or the other one, but it just seems that, that this is not something that should not, that should be forgotten. So, so the reason I, I've stubbornly raised this third possibility now for more than three years, and you've heard me, talk, I've talked to you about it when you come down and visit, is uh, there is something structural, I think, going on in the economy. The problem is it doesn't lend itself to, uh, yet, academic research but I can, I can tell, as having been in, the, in business for a long time and, and talking to companies regularly, it's going on. The, the, the re, and so I don't have the answer to your question, but I want to raise it because it's a third explanation that I think we have to think about because it may affect, it will affect how we think about the framework. And uh, to your last comment, so then why aren't we seeing more productivity improvement as a result of it? That's the, that's one of the questions. Why aren't you seeing more productivity improvement? And one of the things we've been doing a lot of work on, at least the Dallas Fed, and we, we don't have the answers. We're trying to think through a bunch of questions. And we're having a conference, by the way, on this in May, our second one, just to invite the community to attack these questions. Uh, this issue of human capital and adaptability of human capital. It's not the first time in our history we've dealt with it, but this issue of the high school or less uh, being more on the brunt end, receiving end of the effects of these improvements as opposed to participating in them. I think that's, we're, we're, we have a thesis at least that we've been talking about that that's why, because we measure productivity workforce wide, uh, the benefits of these trends may be very unevenly shared which may be why you're seeing more income inequality and all these other issues that we're dealing with. But we don't have the answers. We're, we're asking the questions, and we plan to continue to dig in. And we want to invite the rest of the research community to help us and see if others have good ideas, which they do, on how to under, understand and think about this. Mary, you want to? Yeah, there seems like a lot of other questions. Okay. So I'll hear you. Uh, yeah, Bill Nelson in the back and somebody him to Thank you. Bill Nelson from the Bank Policy Institute. I think this question is for President Daly, but I'd be interested in any uh, anyone's views. So I look out there, I see two-sided risks. I also worry about the fact that, you know, inflation could get anchored on the bad side of two, and uh, the, the zero lower bound gets looks pretty uh, close. Uh, but at the same time, I worry that historical relationships could reassert themselves. Inflation could start moving up. The Fed could find itself on the accommodative side of our star and a flat yield curve, I mean, a flat Phillips curve. Uh, you know, I, isn't there a risk if the Fed is responding to uh, an average of inflation that it gets behind the curve? I mean, so it's moving up slowly because it's responding to average inflation. Meanwhile, real interest rates move down because expected inflation has gone up, pushing the unemployment rate the wrong way on a Phillips curve whose uh, intercept has also moved up because expected inflation is higher. So it, it just seems, I, I do, I am concerned that adopting a, an averaging mechanism will put us back in the old days of the Fed getting behind the curve, overreacting, and, you know, adding to business cycle uh, variability. So that, that's a great question. So let me start by saying that the discussion I had today is in a context of a broader set of work that many here have done, and, and we just had a monetary policy forum in New York where we talked about this, about is the Phillips curve one dead or just hibernating? That was the title of the paper. But I think the more even deeper work is, does it have these nonlinearities that surprise us? Or can we see them coming? So if you have a gradual increase in inflation, that's a very different 
problem than if you have, you're going uh, steadily along below your target and then suddenly you have sharp increases, which is what you would worry if you're gonna get behind the curve. In average inflation targeting, especially if you're using six quarters or three years, you're really not saying we're gonna average over 10 years and so we could really get behind the curve and have volatile cyclical swings that we don't offset because we are committed to this long average. It's one of the reasons I'm well, it's more, it's more heartening that the window length can be short, that you don't have to go something to like full price level targeting where you have a full makeup strategy because then I think those things do become more prominent. But all in the context of, it, I guess the main thing I wanna say is you can't adopt any framework without both sides of the risks assessed. Right now, the prominent risk that I focused on was the one that we've been talking about a lot. We've got low R star, slow growth, low inflation. That's something we're not used to. But we also have to keep studying what happens in our economy when we really heat up. And we just don't have a lot of evidence that sharp nonlinearities form either aggregate in the aggregate data or even in the MSA data where we have many more experiences of super hot economies. Uh, gentleman kind of in front of Bill right there. Yeah, right there. Thank you, Andy Falardo from the BIS. And so uh, I agree it's really great that uh, the Fed is now regularly uh, reviewing its monetary policy framework. Um, and I appreciate the efforts to try to squeeze a little bit more performance out of a flexible inflation targeting uh, regime. I'm not sure, based on what I saw today, that there's a clear urgent need to do so or that we're clearing this high bar that Mary talked about. But I question the timing of this particular topic, and I, I wonder if some people can talk to this. Um, I don't think that you know, any one of these strategies would help to prevent a future crisis from occurring. And in the, sh you know, the shadow of the great financial crisis has largely faded. And I think people now, when they heard that the Fed was gonna do a review, I thought we had expectations that you'd take on some issues about how to do monetary policy to prevent the big problems such as uh, financial crises. And so the question is, do you think that monetary, play, monetary policy has played really no role in the run up to the GFC? Um, and it was just one big shock that came out of nowhere. And so therefore, this is fine. We just focus on uh, flexible inflation targeting. Or is this a topic, for, it's much t more difficult to deal with this monetary policy question about how to deal with crises. And that's for a later date. Or is it simply that the rest of the world is moving on to other types of monetary policy frameworks that look at flexible inflation targeting, macroprudential tools, and the external uh, environment, like at the IMF with its integrated policy framework, and the Fed will sort of follow after a while after some of that debate goes on? Sure, I can talk about it. <laughs> Well, I think the company line is that uh, uh, we, the, in the U.S. we passed the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, we increased capital requirements a lot for banks, and we put on other types of regulation, and that was appropriate because you don't want to try to react to that with uh, monetary policy. I do think there is a fundamental problem on the horizon or maybe with us today, which is the potential collapse of inflation expectations uh, down to zero. And I think that has happened in Japan and it's been very hard to get off that and it looks like it's happening in Europe and it would be very, you know, looks like it's going to be very difficult for them as well. So I would see this discussion as being very relevant to not allowing uh, inflation expectations in the US to follow uh, in the path of Japan or Europe and I would see that as very much related to the framework uh, discussion. Let, let me just add that at the, the uh, upcoming conference at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, there will be a discussion of financial stability and how that relates to the monetary policy part of the framework. So it is something that we've struggled with in terms of the strategy document that was added in after the 2012, and I can't remember the year that financial stability became part of that strategy document, but it's very um, terse. So there is gonna be a discussion of that at the upcoming conference. All right, we've got time for one more question. Brian. Uh, hi, Brian Sack. Um, so one thing I thought would come up today 
would be, um, as part of systematic monetary policy with these threats, would be having the policy rule react directly to inflation expectations. And this is related to the question uh, I asked the vice chair this morning. And I think that the thing to consider is in the models that have been used, right, the expectations are formed consistent with the model. So you're essentially, expectations are, are helping you, you're operating on the path of inflation out in the future. But maybe expectations are also a source of, of risk themselves, and we don't fully understand how they evolve, and they may change for ways because people don't believe the model or see other factors or so on. So isn't there a case for actually having the policy rule react directly and forcefully to changes in inflation expectations, particularly longer run inflation expectations? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, in my other work where I uh, depart from rational expectations, then the expectations become a state variable of the system and you definitely would want to uh, look at that. And some of the literature there does say that you should respond directly to inflation expectations. But I'm also recalling John's figure or equation one, if I'm not mistaken, actually had inflation expectations as one of the arguments in the policy rules. So there was a little bit of that today. Um, but I think this is very much an interesting issue. I think the, <clears throat> the literature has also talked about the circularity in this and multiple equilibrium and stuff like that. Um, so, but it's, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm very sympathetic in actual policy making that uh, the state of expectations is a state of the system. It's not, not the same as the rational expectations that we see in the model. I'll just add one piece of practical art is that, I, and I believe, if I remember, it seems like eons ago, the vice chair mentioned this earlier this morning, <laughs> we are, we have a different various measures of inflation expectations right now, but none of them would we would consider perfect, at least I wouldn't consider them perfect, and so you'd have to think about how you bundle them. If you're going to respond to a variable that you don't measure very well and you, you really don't understand its formation, that lends itself to its own uncertainty. So I think it's a very intriguing idea. In fact, when you said it earlier, I wrote it down in my research book, but I, I think we might be not there yet in terms of understanding how they're formed and how to measure them. Okay, uh, I'm getting the signal, it's time to sort of wrap up. We've gone over a little bit. Uh, it's been a fascinating panel, uh, as always, and a fascinating day. Uh, we've had four presidents, plus John Williams talk earlier, and the vice chair. Uh, I just want to make one comment, um, and that is, I think listening to the people who have spoken at this conference, particularly the policymakers, and I don't want to exclude Rich, but when you listen to the presidents, we had five of them participating in, in, in these comments, you begin, begin to realize, I think, the importance of the Federal Reserve System and the role the presidents and the Federal Reserve Banks pay, play. They are an important source of new ideas. And their banks are important sources of research in contributing to the formulation of monetary policy and its, and its execution. Um, I think the other piece I would add is that their independence is an important stalwart in part of preserving the independence of the Federal Reserve System and their protection from the politicization that can often uh, be pressures. And in this heightened political atmosphere, um, they are a critical wall, if you will, or a support system for preserving the independence of the Fed from either party, any, any, any political influence. So I think you get a flavor of the contributions that they can make, the ideas that their banks can contribute, as I said. And again, not taking anything away from the board or from Rich, but I think this illustrates how important the Federal Reserve System's governance structure is and its independence is helped is preserved through the federal for the, for the from the bank system bank system federal reserve bank system so i want to thank all of them for participating making their contributions not only their own contributions but their contributions from their research staffs uh, i think it's really important and i think this it, a day, day like today illustrates that importance i think and i'm really um, i'm really proud of them and proud of the system for for those contributions. So thank you all for being here today. I, I really appreciate it. Thank John and John and, and Mike for helping put this program together. And um, uh, I think we've had a great day. So I guess, I'll, John, I should bring it to a close. Is there any other? Okay, so we can move straight to the bar is what you're saying. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.